So what we're gonna end up doing here is taking our dredge, our eight inch dredge, and pumping the sand from the west point of the uh, breachway there, and we'll be dumping it in through a pipeline on the other side in uh, Marsh there. Cut so in. we, at the end of the dredge, we got what we call a cutter head. That cutter head will spin and it'll cut across the sand. And the, uh, we got an eight inch pump on the back side of that cutter head that'll suck up the sand, pump it through the pipeline and then discharge it into the marsh. Um, so we could have great control going across the bottom at each level, level of uh, indications on the dredge itself. There's a matrix on there that we follow on the computer screen. Once that is to our grade that is set, we just step ahead. Now it, it moves off of the back of the, it pivots off of the stern spud, which is that spud way on the back. So it'll pivot back and forth. And it has a 70 foot radius that we can pivot off of that and move ahead. It'll move ahead at two foot increments. And we'll just keep cutting the, the sand, I guess. 68,000 yards being removed in the breachway here. And half of it will be dumped on this side of the marsh. The other half will be dumped on uh, the east side of the marsh. swings back and forth on the bottom and on the ends that cutter head and that'll sit and chew across that bottom and make that into a slurry. There's a pump right there and that's what pulls it in and sends it right out back. Right now he's setting himself over for another cut. He can make all his movements just with this ladder and his kicker spud. So there's your cutter head that spins around. There's teeth on there, chews it all up real nice. A good slurry. So after it leaves the dredge, it follows this pipeline all the way around onto the bank. And then right past that excavator, a big pile of sand, that's where all the discharge is. And all the slurry pumps in there, the sand's heavy enough, it settles down, and the water rushes out, and then we just grade it out to wherever we want it. It works pretty slick. So here you can see the computer monitors where that cutter head is at all times. And he uh, keeps it at a certain level. Yep. So here's your cutter head, which is at the end of the ladder that's cutting through the material. And GPS is linked to that. And wherever he picks it up or down to, that'll move to that level. So he follows a line. And that line is the grade we want the material to be after we're done. This is how much material is actually there. So as he cuts through it, it disappears. Same with up here. GPS is linked to the machine. When he sets that over, it'll follow him. It also tracks his progress. So all this dark blue here is all material, and after he goes through it, it turns to a different color so he knows that he already went through that material. purpose of this project basically is to try to restore the salt marsh to a healthy situation. Um, currently as sea level has, has raised up, the marsh is actually drowning in place. The, uh, instead of it draining properly at a low tide, it's, kind of, it's got big puddles of water in it and you get algae and so forth that kills the vegetation in there. And as a result, there's a transition from the healthy salt marsh vegetation, the different uh, diversity of, of plant life in here is, is starting to go away. And of course the other thing too, and very importantly, is that the environmental quality of the salt marsh is compromised. So the various species of wildlife is losing its habitat. 
and there are two particular species of, of birds that are almost getting extinct because of the loss of marsh area. So by recreating this salt marsh, so it's a healthy, well-drained marsh, there's going to be more areas for these uh, species to, to survive and, and grow. And at the tame, same time, the value in terms of fish habitat is going to improve as well. because So there's so many various functions of a salt marsh. It's our, our most, really most important part of our environment is, is the salt marsh and the wetland vegetation. So hopefully we're by in a few years. Yeah. This is also a win-win situation for everyone involved because in addition to recreating an appropriate salt marsh, it's, it's improving the recreational opportunities, the flushing of the ponds that exist here, and the opportunity and the boating navigation improvements as well. So it's essentially a project like this is a win-win. It's a win for the environment. It's a win for the recreational and continued usage of these uh, very, very important salt ponds. These but by having a good flow in and out of the breachway in these channels, it freshens the water, it dilutes the high newt nitrate concentration, so again, it makes for a, a healthier pond. Well, Bob, what you're seeing here is the, uh, the west side, I mean, the east side of the, uh, of the salt marsh being worked at. That's the second phase. Uh, the main channel is now being dredged, and the material is coming into this end of the uh, marsh area. Most of this marsh area is state and government owned, also owned by uh, some private conservation trusts. Um, during the Depression era, they did a lot of mosquito uh, trenching in this area. And of course, we've known now over time that that wasn't a good practice to be in. And uh, so what it did is it caused a lot of shoaling and again, um, uh, blockage of the, uh, the flow and proper drainage of the salt marsh. So the preparation for this project, elevations were taken throughout this marsh area and the, essentially the sinkholes, if you will, and pans were identified and they will receive more of the material vertically than some of the other spots. So we will have a well-drained uh, marsh when, we're all set, uh, when it's all said and done. Uh, in most cases, the layer of material that's placed on the marsh will be uh, thin enough that the existing vegetation will grow through it and, and again, re restore a healthy marsh area. Other areas that re receive more material with more of a vertical difference will have to be replanted. So in uh, May, usually in May, April, May, June area, uh, teams of volunteers will come out and revegetate the, uh, the uh, plant life that needs to be done. And this is all uh, being done by, uh, you know, competent biologists that know the uh, wetland ecology here. So the big uh, uh, excavator over there actually is needed to move the pipe. And you can actually hear the, the material coming through the pipe now. Of course, about 85% of what's coming through here is actually seawater you know, with the, with the sand mixed in. And so right now they're working on that elevation and they'll be working on that, that phase of the project. The west side phase is pretty well set up now. The west channel is done. So now we're focusing on the east side. And, and, and this is actually the main channel that will be restored here. Um, most of the material that, that'll be planted comes from a, uh, a nursery down in New Jersey. But we also have a little pilot program of local high school students that are also learning to grow marsh grass in their agriculture uh, vocational program. So they too will be involved in the, in the uh, replanting of the marsh. So it's January 6th and um, we're going to head out from uh, Ocean House Marina down to the Charlestown Breachway to check out uh, the staging up of uh, the dredging that's going to be uh, starting uh, this week. Um, this was a maintenance dredging uh, of the breachway area 
that is being funded by the town of Charlestown in its entirety. In the short term, we knew that um, there was a marsh restoration project going on in Kwani this winter, and so we thought what better time to match up with the contractor that was in town to get our best available price. Um, and uh, so we're heading out now to look at that project. It's kind of in its infancy. Um, obviously, the award was December 26th, but Brennan was able, to, uh, the contractor, Jay, Jay Brennan, was able to mobilize. And uh, they've already got the pipe and some equipment um, at the breach tray right now. So we'll probably see some of that. They're welding the pipe sections together, and then they'll be um, put on the beach so that we can transport the sediment from the basin all the way down to Charlestown Beach. But as we come in, you're going to see where uh, the sediment has built up and essentially blocked the flow of water coming in the pond. Two, one, three, one, five, one, eight. And again, this was all dredged to a depth of eight feet. Uh, Two years ago. Here it's a it's essentially a volume job. They know what they've got. They've got they've dredged this before. They know it's all good sand. It's good uh, nourishment for the beaches. So uh, this will go came from the beach. will go right back onto the beach. This um, pipe will then come out of the water right here, just like you have it now, and it'll go out onto the beach and all the way down to Charlestown Beach. We had to get permission from every property owner along the beach so that we can run the pipe above the high water mark so it doesn't risk uh, uh, of being um, uh, on a storm if there's a storm event that doesn't get washed into the ocean. So here we are again. Uh... Charlestown Breachway, um, again, thanks to a lot of hard work, particularly the Charlestown government, CRMC, we were able to realize that there was a problem developing, shoaling up the, uh, the breachway, which wasn't dredged that long ago. So fortunately, the town of Charlestown and all the folks that work together, Salt Ponds Coalition, uh, many volunteers, the Harbor Commission in Charlestown, everybody that pitched in, that was able to have the funds to make this happen. So while Brennan is in the area, we have a chance to get this uh, sandbar uh, dredged out. We don't know really what caused it to happen, you know, in such a short time, but uh, it blocked up the breachway. So now that we have the apparatus in here and that area will be cleaned up, and that will improve the flow into uh, Nintegrate Pond, which is absolutely critical to the water quality and health of the pond. So thank goodness all the moons lined up and uh, there was sufficient funds and Brennan was right here in town to be able to do this. So this uh, is working out very, very well. Of course, the material coming from this operation is going out for be beach replenishment, which is always needed. Uh, particularly in this in this part of the area. Uh, this benefits the Charlestown Beach area, but also, since Longshore Drift brings the material from west to east, Green Hill Beach will also get the benefit of this, uh, this dredging operation. Okay, well, this is uh, the end, end result of the, uh, of the dredging operation. The pipe is going down uh, right along the high tide line of Charlestown Beach. Um, and the material be, will be used for beach nourishment, which is a really good thing. Um, this beach, of course, has, like all the other coastal beaches in Rhode Island, had its share of beach erosion. And uh, some of those houses that, well, that area that's right immediately behind us where there's a clearing was actually three houses that uh, were, were destroyed in a winter storm in 77, 78.
and some of those houses have been moved. So it's very important to, to uh, maintain this beach in a, in a good, healthy manner, and certainly the dredge spoil gives it good material, and it's all, it's all beach sand material that goes back on to restore the beach. Uh, the reason that we do it this way is to put the water right into circulation. Uh, one of the main movements of water in this area called longshore drift, actually there's a net movement that goes from west to east. So the, between the Earth's rotation, the orientation of our beaches the way they are, there is a movement of that sand. So by putting the sand right at the tide line, high tide line, the next tide will carry that sand where it wants to go, where it belongs, rather than have a pile somewhere. Uh, so it's a, it's a good, healthy distribution, and as I said, it moves from west to east, so anything east of where the pipe uh, ends up is going to get the benefit of it. Certainly in the short term, Charlestown Beach, and in the long term, Green Hill Beach also will be uh, given a lot of this sand material as it work, works its way down. If we did have the discharge, like a lot of places down south, they will just pump the sand right onto the beach face and then they'll take a big machine front end loader or whatnot to distribute it. This makes it a lot smoother, a lot easier, let nature do its thing. On the other hand, if it were piled up on the beach face, then that would open up the necessity for a piping blower restoration, which may impact uh, public access to this area during the mating season, the piping blowers. So by this material going into the sea and being washed that way, it, it uh, not only re replaces and, and uh, restores the beach area, but it makes it a good public access for the general public. Today we're here planting marsh grass out on Kwani Marsh. Uh, it's the next phase in the Kwanakatog Marsh Restoration Project. It started with the dredging and now we're up here on the marsh. Save the Bay was out here most of the winter making sure that the drainage on the marsh was working properly so that when we're actually putting the plants down they have a great habitat to live in. You can see the plants behind me. Uh, we're starting in this section of the marsh planting to stickless. Um, so that's what we'll be doing today and there'll be volunteers over the next coming over the next few days planting about 1700 plants uh, across the marsh. I'm Wenley Ferguson and I work with Save the Bay and I coordinate Save the Bay's habitat restoration projects. Save the Bay has been a partner with Coastal Resources Management Council and the Salt Pond Coalition and the town of Charlestown on this restoration effort at Quantico-Tog Salt Marsh. We're on the east side of the breachway um, today, planting uh, some salt marsh grasses, and this is the it's mid-May, May 15th, and this is the first day we started planting the salt marsh grasses. Um, our role at these projects is to come in and um, establish drainage and do uh, additional grading after the sediment has been placed on the salt marsh. In December and January of this uh, four or five months ago, Brennan, the contractor that did the dredging, pumped the sediment onto the marsh and graded it with bulldozers to a, um, to a design elevation. But uh, just like any project, um, sediment has moved and this is pretty fine sediment so we've come in with a low ground pressure excavator and done like the grading behind me that was very hummocky their large bulldozers weren't really able to grade down to salt marsh elevation um, because they were so big so what we've been able to do with the state's low ground pressure excavator is come up with a final grading plan and allow the groundwater that is trapped in this in the sand that was placed to drain out and as well we uh, developed as you can see behind me some swales and drainage channels so that um, both the groundwater just on the um, inland side of where the sediment was placed and the salt water the groundwater can flow out and then the salt water during some of the higher tide events can flow into the area where the sediment was placed if I'm digging here, um, the soil 
is looking pretty good um, for root growth. Um, if in areas that aren't well drained, you get that um, anoxic black layer very close to the surface, and that is not good for root growth. And this is not a surprise here, Bob, where I notice this is a little bit of a depression, and you can smell that soil, and if you look down here, see how close um, close to the surface, it's probably only a centimeter below the surface is that anoxic layer of um, soil. So this is an area uh, where the water uh, definitely does not drain as well. So that's why we need to keep doing a little more, you know, we're clearly not done with the, um, creating these small little runnels or channels for the water to drain off. But this area, for example, is not an area where we would conduct any planting right now. We're only going to be planting in areas that have better drained soils. Additionally, along with the salt marsh plants, at the spit, what I call the sand spit that was um, built up, sediment uh, was placed on a, a former very narrow spit of land that was getting inundated more and more. It was eroding more and more with um, inundated each tide. Um, we built up the elevation of that with the sediment that was dredged from the breachway. And this February, we started planting beach grass, so uh, dune grass, um, on that peninsula. And the goal there was to both stabilize the sand um, right after it was placed, because of course dry sand can get windswept. And um, also we were, the goal was to create a little bit of a dune habitat. And that area where the spit is located is a, a wonderful um, public access area that's been developed as part of this restoration project. I'm, I'm Caitlin Chafee. I'm a policy analyst at the Coastal Resources Management Council. Um, we are kind of the lead agency for this project. We're the Coastal Zone Management Agency for Rhode Island. Um, so we secured the funding and are managing the grants and all the contracts that are involved. Um, we managed and oversaw phase one of this project, which involved getting a marine contractor. And we worked with JF Brennan. They're out of La Crosse, Wisconsin. So they came in with hydraulic dredges, two of them, and deployed them in the channel of the pond over here and in, right inside the channel and dredged. They kind of, the, they have a cutter head that disturbs the sediment, then it gets sucked through a pipe. Um, and they dredged about 70,000 cubic yards of material, and then that was piped onto the degraded marsh surface, and then they smoothed the material out with low ground pressure equipment. And so the idea was to, to transfer all that material onto the marsh and then get it close to our design elevations. Brennan's work was really to move the material, to do a first pass at grading and try to get the design close to where it needed to be. And then after they left the site, Save the Bay came in and have been fine tuning that work ever since. So they're working with much smaller equipment, making really fine adjustments to the grades and the elevations. They've been installing the, the drainage creeks that you see over here to help um, maintain drainage and prevent water from ponding on the marsh, which was kind of what causes the problems in the first place. And so this is really phase two. And we really couldn't do it without both, both teams of people. So Brennan was a great contractor to work with. They have the right equipment and, um, and then, but it's really necessary to have that kind of second pass where you can fine tune things and see where things are settling out and go back and kind of fix whatever needs to be fixed. So Save the Bay has been great um, helping us with that. And then, and then they're of course leading the planting effort, which is starting now. So, so if all goes well, we'll hopefully see some natural regrowth this year. But um, if it's anything like the project over in Ninigrit that we did, and that was um, done in 2017, um, really next year is when things will probably start to take off in terms of plant growth. So fingers crossed, that'll happen at Kwani as well. Uh, my name is Suzanne Payton, and I'm a biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. 
Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service has been very concerned about a species called the salt marsh sparrow. It's a species that nests only in coastal salt marshes. Uh, their entire worldwide distribution is between Maine and Virginia uh, in the U.S. and then they spend the winter in the southern part of the United States. So we have a big responsibility here in the Northeast for that for that species. Um, and we have recent research um, coming out of several universities, including the University of Connecticut, is showing that their populations have declined by 85% in the last 20 years. So this site at Kwani um, had, I believe, almost no, I mean, there might have been, I remember walking out here, there were some small, really small patches of vegetation, but there was essentially no remaining habitat that was suitable for the salt marsh sparrow to nest in. So the, this site was selected to receive sediment and the idea is that we'll build the elevation of the marsh, help it to revegetate. Um, in some places where it's just a thin layer of sediment, we expect the marsh vegetation to grow right up through. Um, and in other places, we're gonna be planting to jumpstart the vegetation um, so that we can use it to help our marshes um, keep up into the future. So we'll still have marshes here in Rhode Island and, and elsewhere. Um, and hopefully we'll have the right kind of marshes that the salt marsh sparrow can use so that we don't risk losing them altogether.